keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. In February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 76 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet now for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost around 70 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. So this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put some links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yeah. So we share this great food we can eat on this diet with you. Every episode, both of us share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So let's start episode number 28, Richard. The Hunger Show. Yeah. <laughs> Should we call it the Hangry Show? The Hangry Show. I kind of like, oh, the Hunger Games or... Do we have any corrections or apologies from last week, Richard? Oh, yeah. I uh, said that of the 54 randomized controlled trials testing low-carb versus low-fat, that 43 of those showed that low-carb was better and that 26 of those were significant. Hmm. The, the reality is that 47 of those 54 showed that low-carb was better, and of those, 27 were significant. So I, I underestimated yet again. Once again, you erred on the side of caution, <laughs> which we cannot fault you for. So before we get into the show, let's reprise about a ketogenic diet. What is it? We keep our carbs to incidental carbs. Yeah. I try to keep mine as low as possible. You know, you'll hear under 20, under 50, under 40, whatever. Uh, just low. Yeah, we we say under twenty because pretty much anybody who goes under twenty will be uh, in ketosis. So, uh, but yeah, uh, j just don't eat sugar and starch. That's the easy mm. the easy answer. I found that a lot of people don't know the difference between a protein and a carbohydrate and and all of this stuff. I was talking to somebody at the party last weekend, 
And uh, she looked at me and said, oh, it's too bad you can't have that cheese. Hmm. There's a lot of carbs and cheese. Yeah. And, you know, people just don't know. There's a little bit, so, but not a lot. Well, very, very little yeah. bit. But she thought there was they were loaded with, with carbs. Also, we eat just enough protein for our bodies to stay healthy. And uh, what that is depends on a few things. And we use a keto calculator to, to figure that out. We do. And then the rest of our energy comes from fat, either the fat on our plate or the fat from that Krispy Kreme donut we ate a decade ago. Oh, yeah. I'm getting good at explaining this stuff, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. We've only been Not doing bad. it for, what, five months? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Uh, how have you been this week? How'd you do? Well, it's not been that long since we did our last recording when we right. recorded for Ivor. But yep. um, so I've got no new medical information. Um, I am getting ready for the seven day Zorn fast that's coming up. Uh, mm. So this Sunday, I'm going to start uh, after dinner on Sunday. I'm not going to eat for seven days. And my next meal will be the dinner on the Sunday following. I already know what I'm going to eat. Uh, we've got, I've got my eye on some uh, Wagyu beef. So. Mm, yeah, mm. but what do you call it? Meat flavored fat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so beef flavored fat. Yeah. So um, so uh, so I'm getting ready for that. So what do you do when you get ready to fast? Well, uh, what I did was I bought a whole bunch of bones, and I've got because I'm going to make up some bone broth. So mm. I've got some chicken claws and yeah. some chicken frames, which are the frames are just the the. The, the body after all of the, the, the good cuts have been pulled off. Yep. Um, so it's got a bit of meat, but mostly bones and stuff. And then wingtips. And so um, so I'm going to basically, uh, I'm going to bake the wingtips and the claws and probably the frames as well, to be honest, in the oven. And then I'm going to chuck it in a, in a pressure cooker and I'm going to cook them up and with a bay leaf and some uh, some vegetables, maybe onion or so, and make up some chicken stock. So really nice, unctuous sort of uh, yeah. thick gelatinous chicken stock. Yeah, nice. And the other thing I the other thing I did was I got a kilo of bacon bones and I got uh, two smoked ham hocks and I'm making up a tureen for Julie to eat while I'm fasting, and I'm going to get all of the uh, the pork stock that comes out of that, which is mm. also delicious. That's great. Yeah, so that's my week. Um, how would, how'd your week go, Carl? Oh, it's just great. You know, I feel great. I, I'm uh, still down and enjoying the spoils of my fasting and my, uh, you know, my efforts. And I'm not sure if I'm going to fast with you guys this month. I may just be in maintenance mode for a while. I'm just yeah. finding food really, really delicious right now. <laughs> oh, well, we all go through times like that. So yeah, the good thing is, even even when I go through times like that, I don't really put on a lot of weight because um, my appetite is managed really yep. quite nicely. If, exactly. if I manage my hormones, my appetite looks after me. So yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm going to enjoy the fast. I'm actually going to have a good time. And at the end of that, I'm going to do a 100K bike ride. So I'm going to not eat for a week and do a 100K bike ride. Now, that is something I'm, I plan to do this week. I have a recumbent okay. three-wheel bike. I guess wow. you can call it a tricycle, but, you know, the image of a fat guy on a tricycle is really funny. So I don't call it a tricycle. No. I call it a recumbent. But it's got two wheels in front and one in the back. It's a Trek. Nice. And uh, I love it. I've I've ridden it all over the place. It's got three derailers, so 81 speeds. Nice. And, uh, yeah, going up a hill is no problem. You have this very, very low gear. It takes you forever, but you can just yeah. basically, you know, just go right up. So I'm probably going to pull that out this week. Uh, I'm, I'm just feeling it. You know, I think mm -hmm. now's the time where I have to add in regular exercise to my regimen because I feel like I want to. Yeah, your body will tell you. That's yeah. the thing with me. You know, I first probably six months, I really didn't, I didn't feel like a lot of exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of pushed myself to go to the gym because I'd been going to the gym to a personal trainer for almost 10 years. And so, uh, yeah. so I was like committed to doing this even though I hated it. And I did hate it for the whole 10 years, yeah. but I did it anyway because I felt like it was what I had to do to say to keep my body from going, going out of control. Yeah. But, um, after probably about five or six months, all of a sudden I wanted to go. I wanted to go for long bike rides. Yeah. I'd actually, go the long way around to get to the gym yeah. just because I felt like some exercise. And uh, so it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's wonderful. I never thought I would like it. <laughs> no, I know. I never thought I'd become a diet guru. <laughs> but and, and I never thought I, I never ever thought I'd, I'd actually willingly do exercise, but yeah. you know, I really enjoy it. 
Yeah. So we'll uh, check back in next week to see how that went uh, in the exercise department. Hey, you know what? We got some mail, so let's roll that crazy music. It's time for... Mail! We're just and we don't need no Mail! 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 So uh, uh, the first one we're going to take is from Kelly, who uh, posted on our Facebook group. And if you want to come and join us on the Facebook group, we've got over 2,000 people. We're probably closer to 2,500 mm-hmm. now uh, people. Uh, and you can get to our Facebook group by just going to fb for Facebook dot two keto, the number two keto dot com. Anyway, Kelly uh, said, um, I'm a bit concerned. My freestyle opti arrived today. That's her blood meter. And I've got the same one. It does ketones and and glucose meet, uh, readings. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she says, um, my freestyle opti arrived today and I took a blood ketone reading before dinner. It was 5.0 millimoles per litre. Mm. I only eat dinner and during the day I have a couple of coffees with cream. Is this reading normal? I would appreciate somebody else's opinion. According to the pamphlet, I'm borderline ketoacidosis. Ugh. Oh, dear. Oh, well, dear see, indeed. this is the thing. Yeah. Ketoacidosis happens when you don't make any insulin at all. Right. So your liver goes into glucose making overdrive and that causes the ketones to spill. And in, in normal people, when you make a lot of glucose, insulin goes up and the process shuts itself off. Mm. But when you can't make insulin, it's like you're going into a into a car race without a brake pedal. Yep. You know, you can't literally can't turn the thing off. This is why doctors freak out a little bit about ketoacidosis because ketoacidosis is very dangerous for people who can't make insulin, like type 1 diabetics. Right. It's a signal so, to them that there's that there's something very, very wrong for a type 1 diabetic. Yeah. But anybody yeah. who doesn't have type 1 diabetes isn't at risk of getting ketoacidosis. But how does that explain her high levels? I mean, I, it's not close to ketoacidosis as far as I know. No. No, it's not. So the the thing with ketoacidosis is it's really in the 15 to 25 millimole per litre range of ketones. Mm. She was 5 millimoles. That's nowhere near 15. Mm. The, Professor Finney refers to it as a nutritional level of ketones, which is what we, we all have a nutritional level of ketones, is like a light summer rain, and diabetic ketoacidosis is a typhoon. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's totally different orders of scale. Right. But the thing with uh, the ketoacidosis is eventually you make so much, so many ketones that they overwhelm your system and your body can't buffer the pH fast enough to cope with so many ketones coming in. So yeah. that, that's where the acidosis comes in because normally your body buffers your pH by making bicarbonate. If you If you have something acidic comes into your body, your body makes bicarbonate out of carbon dioxide and uh, – you know, it's it's amazing. The bodies are a remarkable thing. It's brilliant. I, I'm learning more and more about what this brilliant body does every day. So, so it makes either bicarbonate if you're at, if you're too acidic, it makes bicarbonate to to uh, to raise raise your pH, and if you're too alkaline, it makes carbox uh, carboxylic acid, I believe, or uh, one of the one of the car- Basically, out of carbon dioxide as well. So it's hmm. making these two different chemicals out of carbon dioxide to. Uh, and which organ makes the um, makes either an acid or a base out of? I really don't know. Huh. I really. I, I'm assuming it's probably the liver. Yeah, but, liver does know, all the liver. these other magic things. If anybody right. knows, please write us and let us yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Doctor yeah. Google will know. I'm sure. Absolutely. So. Nutritional ketosis, which is what we're doing, is more likely in the 0.5 to 3.0 range, although some people can get up to around 7 or 8. So, you know, if uh, Kelly had had 7 or 8, I would still say, you know, a near ketoacidosis. Um, you make ketones as you make glucose, and when you don't eat any uh of either, the amount of each in your blood is related to how fast you're using them. So most people in the early days have high ketones because their brains are still running mainly on glucose. So eventually your brain adapts. This is part of the keto adaptation process. And eventually it'll be ending up getting at up to 80% of its energy from ketones mm. and 20% from glucose. And then the amount of ketones left in your blood will go down because you're using them. So, so really the amount of ketones you have in your blood is related to how quickly use them more so than how fast you're producing them. Well, whew, glad you explained that. Phew. 
<laughs> so there's a couple of things you can do to increase your ketones. A cardio exercise is one. Uh, and I believe this is because you're working your red blood cells uh, making them carry more oxygen and mm. so they need more glucose because they're doing more work. And so as you use more glucose, because ketones and glucose are in a balance, you end up with more ketones. Um, ketones as a ratio will go up. Right. Um, my normal level of ketones is between 0.4 and 0.8. It's barely in a nutritional level of ketosis. Mm -hmm. And that's just because I'm very good. I'm, I'm, my body is very good at using them. Um, and it's very good at making the amount that it, it expects to use. But if I do some fasted exercise and if I do cardio for more than about two hours, then my ketones will shoot up to 2.5. And that's mm. just part of the normal uh, uh, reaction of the body. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, uh, I have a message here from Josh, and this is also uh, posted in our Facebook group. And again, you can join us at fb.2keto.com. Josh says... My wife is considering keto, but had her gallbladder removed four years ago. She's worried about her ability to digest so much fat. Is there any guidance out there for this type of situation? And the reason I'm interested in Josh's question is because, is because my wife believes that uh, she has gallbladder issues. She still has a gallbladder, but all her sisters and her mother all had gallbladder issues. Right. And so it sort of runs in the family. So she also has a problem um, eating too much fat. So doctors often say that uh, about uh, gallbladder issues that uh, that you that most of their patients that, that will require that have gallstones are female, fertile and 40. Hmm. So and I have seen um, some justification for why it happens to women who've had a lot of pregnancies mm. and are at that particular age. Um, it, it just seems to be that that's the majority of the cases. Now, I've I've got a, fr a, a male friend of mine who's had uh, had horrible gallstones, mm. had them had his entire gallbladder removed. What what the organ actually does? It's not really much of an organ. It's more of a of a reservoir. It's a storage place for bile. Yeah. The, yeah, that's it. So you can't. Long fat, long chain fatty acids you can't get across your gut wall. Yeah. Short chain fatty acids and medium chains will go across. That's why we tell people to eat coconut oil or right. butter because these things get straight across the gut wall. But long chain uh, fatty acids need bile salts to get across the the gut wall into the lymph. So, um, so what happens is that your liver produces these bile salts at the top of your gut and then it reclaims them at the bottom of your gut. Mm. So this is like a conveyor belt of uh, of bile salts for getting fat out of your gut and into your blood supply. Yeah. Your liver does this. So if you remove your gallbladder, you just have a continual stream of bile salts and it means that you're going to be able to eat a smaller amount of fat in one sitting. Right. When you have a gallbladder, it can fill up full of bile and when you have a big fatty meal, a massive big fatty meal, that gallbladder – it pulses and squeezes all of that bile out. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a way of batching up bile. So let me read some of the responses because me personally, I don't have gallbladder issues and I don't really understand any more than, you know, you do about what the gallbladder does. But Joshua says, a friend of mine in the same condition picked up some ox bile supplements and said they helped for the first few weeks when things were a little more loose than normal. But after right. a few weeks, everything normalized. I uh, imagine without being able to store the extra bile, the extra fat just flows through and eventually the liver ups the production. Not sure if I've seen any science on this, but I've read and heard anecdotal testimonies. Yeah. Uh, Andrew says, I've had my gallbladder removed and I was concerned about the same thing. My experience, particularly once I got a little more serious about what I was consuming, has been good. Mm. I've also added in extended three to four day fasts in addition to doing intermittent fasting most of the time. I do occasionally end up with some GI stuff, and I don't know if that has anything to do with the gallbladder, but it's completely tolerable. I agree with others that easing into it is probably wise. I'd be particularly cautious with coconut oil and MCT oil. I can take them both, but tend to keep the amount small. Now, that's an interesting comment because what you just said was that, you know, bile isn't required to get right. MCT oil coconut oil, for example, which is rich in MCT, medium chain triglycerides through the gut wall. Yeah. So the other thing about his case is that because he's intermittent fasting, he's batching all of his meals up into one into one meal during the day, Yeah. one small f w feeding window. Mm. So if he's eating a lot of fat in that small feeding window, he probably doesn't have the capacity to, to produce 
all of that bile in one in one batch. And we're so. talking really animal fat here, right? Saturated fat. Yeah. Long chain. Yeah, most of the long chain. Anything that's over, uh, I think, fourteen uh, carbon units long. Okay. Uh, so it's 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 pretty much all of the all of the triglycerides. Yeah. Um, except for you know your, your short ones like uh, butter. There's probably like ten uh, percent of butter is short chain. Um, fatty acids like butyrate or butyric mm. acid. Um, there's a couple of others like um, uh, caprylic acid and uh, lauric acid. Um, these uh, these are all uh, these are all medium chain triglycerides. They'll go straight across the gut wall, and then longer chain ones have to be basically portaged in with uh, yeah. bile salts. Or they end up in the lymph. Yep. The short and medium chain ones go straight to the liver and get converted straight into uh, into energy and the long chain ones, they bypass the liver and they go to the rest of the body. Great. So, and then there's a lot of comments like this. Kim said, I had mine out 10 years ago. I had gastric distress on carb plus fat, happy as a clam and much improved digestion on keto. Awesome. Beverly says, I don't have a gallbladder and I'm fine. I have an occasional issue, but far less than before keto. Madeline says, mine has been out since 2010. I think keto is the best thing ever. Um, Debbie says, I also have no problem with removed gallbladder. Also, Jason Fung posted on his Q&A site that he's never had any experience of any of his patients having an issue either. And Kim says, according to my doc, after a few months without a gallbladder, your body often actually forms a pocket wow. where bile is stored, like a pseudo gallbladder. I don't know if it's actually yeah. true, but it fits her experience post-surgery. Yeah, I've, 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 I know a lot of uh, people have had about, and they are on keto without a problem. So, all right, very good. So, let's talk about hunger. Let me start off by saying I've been binging on some movies that have been made around, you know, particularly low sugar and low carb diets recently. Okay, I saw Fed Up. I don't know if you've seen that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that one. That's awesome. That yeah. was a good one. And before that, I saw that sugar film. Oh yeah, that's Damien Gamo. He's an Aussie. We should uh, we should get him on and uh, have an interview with him. Absolutely. That sugar film was really interesting. What he decided to do, and you know, just like oh, and I saw Super Size Me too. Oh, okay. And Super Size Me was the guy who decided to. He was healthy. Yeah. And he had no metabolic problems whatsoever. He was a perfect specimen of health. And he decided he was going to eat McDonald's for 30 days. And if and he also had a rule that if they asked him if he wanted supersize, he had to say yes. Yeah, that's like it's like a it's, it's like a nutritional jackass that <laughs> really. Yeah, exactly, oh, exactly. Man. And his doctors, even after a couple of weeks, were like, "You you got to stop this." But yeah. he kept going, yeah. and he ended up with a huge fatty liver. He ended up putting on like I don't know four, thirty pounds or something. You know, one thing that bugged me, Richard, about supersize me. Yeah was that the the general practitioner looked at his liver numbers and was freaking out and he's he I remember him saying this a couple of times he said you know if you were an alcoholic and you came to me with these liver numbers I would I would understand it but I would never have guessed you could get this dysfunction from a high fat diet <sighs> and he said high fat diet several times yeah as you know just essentially not even thinking about it, just pointing the finger at the fat in the McDonald's food rather than the sugar right. and the carbohydrates. And the carbohydrates. I mean, the, the thing is that, that other than knowing the history of a patient being an alcoholic, there is no difference between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's no way to tell the difference in a microscope. Right. So it's exactly the same thing. It's just you ask the patient, do they drink alcohol? And if they'd say, I drink alcohol quite a bit, then you put them down as alcoholic fatty liver. So it's- And the science behind that is real. Yeah. And it is that glucose actually gets metabolized. Fructose goes right to the liver. Yes, that's right. And fructose is rampant in McDonald's food. High fructose corn syrup is in the buns. Sure. It's in the drinks. It's in the drinks. Yeah. Uh, completely in the drinks. And as we know from Robert Lustig's work, yeah, uh, that goes right to the liver and gets metabolized just like alcohol gets metabolized. Turning into fat and stored locally, turning you into human foie gras. So anyway, like that, mm -hmm. that sugar film is a guy who decides to, and he's not eating sugar and he's healthy, but he decides to eat the same amount of sugar 
that the average Australian eats, which turned out to be, I think, 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. Yeah, which right? is a lot of sugar. I mean, the WHO said we should be eating six a day. Yes. So the average Aussie is is eating seven times the amount of sugar that the World Health Organization believes should be our maximum. Right. And he also decided not to eat junk food, quote unquote junk food, oh, okay. but eat what is marketed as healthy food. All right. So low fat foods, whole grain foods, yep. um, you know, breakfast bars, whatever. Anything with a heart smart check on it. Exactly. And of course, you you know and I know, and you don't even have to watch it to find out what happens, right? His health yep. goes way downhill. But it's really well produced and they do a lot of science in it. And Part of it was an fMRI scan. Okay. They put him in this big fMRI machine, which watches your brain activity in real time. Right. Okay. They hooked up a straw to a milkshake. <laughs> right? Like a really <laughs> so long, could, a really long uh, straw. <laughs> <laughs> really long, really big, uh, large bore straw. <laughs> And they showed him pictures of a milkshake first. Okay. They showed him a picture of a milkshake and they watched what happened in his brain. Huge release of dopamine. Wow. Yeah. Dopamine. So basically, and this is after he had been addicted to sugar, right? right. And this was far, far, I don't know, maybe a few, I don't know how long it was in, but he was, he was definitely getting the carb cycle going yeah. here. Yeah. So when you see a... You know, when you see food that is sugary and you're in that low blood sugar craving mode, your brain is flooded with dopamine. Yeah. And so yeah. you obviously have to have that carb. And then when you actually eat it, so he took a sip of, you know, started <laughs> sipping on the milkshake. We're talking opioids. Wow. Got released. Opioids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pleasure, pleasure drugs. It's basically the brain's rewarding you. Yeah, good on you. You just got exactly what I wanted. Yeah. And so, Incredible. you know, that's what happens when you take cocaine. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Turns out sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Yeah. And uh, this is not hunger. No. We're talking about hunger today. All right. This is an addict's uh, brain reaction to not only tasting carbohydrates, sugar, but just looking at it. Yeah, this is not a low energy state. This is the, no. bra the brain recognizing, oh, there's something that I had recently that gave me energy very quickly. Just in case I might need some energy, I'm going to go grab that because it's identified the milkshake that it, it had previously, and it's yes. basically saying, okay, we want now we want one of those. We've just seen it. We want it. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is that this addiction cycle right. was also experienced by the the guy in Supersize Me okay. after about two weeks in, if maybe even three weeks in, he told his doctor, he said, I feel like crap all the time, except after I eat. After I eat McDonald's, I feel wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. He's like, you know, it's like unicorns and, and uh, rainbows. rainbows. And then 45 minutes later, yeah. of course, you have to eat some more. I don't know about you, but for the first 48 years of my life, I recognized that. Absolutely. Uh, that was exactly how I was prior to, prior to breaking. And I don't necessarily think it's specifically sugars the addiction. I think that uh, our brains aren't really well wired to have a lot of this nutrient. They're used to having right. berries sort of at the end of summer and rewarding us to go back into those berries to eat more of them because it's the end of summer, winter is coming and you know you want to put on right. some fat. And sure. we just not we're not we're just not capable of dealing with that. Right. And I, I was in that state for 48 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I would feel ordinary most of the day until I had something to eat. So we want to distinguish between addiction which yeah. is really what this is. It's a cycle of addiction yeah. and hunger. Another thing that I want to mention is a, uh, a very compelling metaphor that was used in another movie called The Perfect Human Diet, right. which is a football field. You know, mm -hmm. If you consider a football field the length of time that Homo sapiens have been on the earth, right. 
right? Homo sapiens being, you know, what we would call the first humans. Yeah. So right. 200,000 so years not, or 300,000 or something. 200,000 years. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, two or three. And and even before the beginning of, you know, this is a mere blip in the history of the earth. Right. All right. Sure. We show up on, you know, December 31st, a few <laughs> minutes to midnight, right. if you're talking right. about the whole. If, you, if you've watched Cosmos, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so this is just that small period of time when we've been on. So processed foods show up a half an inch from the goal. Wow. A half an inch. Half an inch to go. <laughs> half an wow. inch to go. That's how long we've been eating as humans yeah. processed food. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. It's nothing. It's. I'm just thinking how long have, grains have only been around for 10,000 years. That's one twentieth of the distance. So that's got to be yes. like five yards. Five yards is when grains came in. Yeah, that's about right. And for all of the rest of that, we've been eating basically fat and protein. Right. And our sugar has come in the form of apples that may have most likely were not even as sweet as the, you know, engineered sugar bags we have today. Yeah. They were, you can get apples now in the in the region, sort of uh, the Armenian region. They're like little crab apples. They're bitter. They're, little crab apples. Yeah, not yeah. nice at all. So, yeah. And uh, the other movie we should bring up is Fathead. Oh, right. Yeah. Because because we make the pizzas all the time. Right. Fathead pizzas are awesome. They've sustained they've sustained our Facebook group. Seriously, the, yeah, it's true. Yeah, so the Fathead movie was uh, made by Tom Norton, who's a comedian. He's also a computer programmer. He makes a lot of his living out of uh, out of programming, and he's you can see it, find him on YouTube uh, talking about low carb diets. And he did a a presentation to uh, a select uh, committee at in Congress about uh, the reason why people don't trust doctors. But he, um, mm. his movie was basically he, he watched Super Size Me and, and thought, oh, well, that's rubbish, and decided what he would do is he would uh, eat at McDonald's for a month and not put on weight. And he, and he, did, it, <laughs> he did it by basically tossing away the bun and not eating anything with carbs. And uh, <laughs> so, so he proved that you could do that. That wasn't the basis of, the, of his entire movie. But that was the beginning of the genesis of it. And then he went into looking wow. at the problems with our food, the problems with our high-carbohydrate diet. And uh, so that that was a, an awesome movie as well. That said, I wanted to just give everybody the difference between what we're talking about as hunger yeah. and this artificially induced craving that comes from um, carb addiction. So you really can't experience this until you've eliminated carbohydrates. Absolutely. And you have lost those cravings. Yeah. We overproduce insulin when we have carbohydrates if we're insulin resistant. And that means that we end up having, we end up overcorrecting, we end up having low blood sugar, we have an urgent mm. message to go out and refeed every three hours. This is one of the reasons why, you know, you go out and eat Chinese food and you feel like you feel hungry three hours later. Uh, it's, yep. it, it, it's the overcorrection of, uh, of your blood glucose. And once you get into this cycle, it's very difficult to get out of it. Very difficult. You're not able to determine the difference between not having fuel right. And gee, I wouldn't mind eating that. So you know, yeah. yeah once you get out, get the carbs out of you out of your diet, your insulin comes down to a normal level, eventually, and your ability to identify appropriate fueling signals um, turns on. Yeah, a couple more things to point out. Mm. Um, I look at a guy like Tom Seast, who we interviewed previously. Yeah. He had lost almost three hundred pounds, right? Uh, and his method for dieting was essentially. I'm just going to eat mostly fat and I'm only going to eat when I'm hungry and I'm, I don't have set meal times. Um, uh, and you know, bacon <laughs> with cream cheese on it <laughs> right. was his diet pretty much. Yeah. And you know, and he just, he didn't even weigh himself for the first year. He couldn't. Yeah. He was over, over what the scale went up to. Yeah. And uh, and that has been his mo. And you know how many times did he stall? Who knows? Yeah, he just kept at it kept and on. felt better. So this is uh, you know he learned to listen to his body. Yeah. And again, you know, you're thinking, well, I listen to my body. My body tells me for a candy bar because that's an addictive Response. cycle. Yeah, that's it not is. the same it than is. what we're talking about. Yeah. Once you get rid of that noise, now you can hear the real signals. Then you can hear the whisper. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I find, for me, 
and everybody's going to be different. But for me, I can determine the difference between needing fuel and just kind of wanting to eat something. Uh, sure. Because I, I ask myself a question. I say, could I go for a bike ride right now and do an unlimited amount of riding or do I really need to eat something first? Mm. And that question normally gives me the opportunity to think mindfully about the situation. And generally I'll say, actually, you know, I don't feel like eating right now, so I won't, you know, or I'll have a cup of tea or something. Huh. You know, and that question, posing that question to myself, am I ready for some, some exercise? And if I say, hmm. you know, actually, no, I'm not ready for exercise, I really need to eat something first, then that's a, a true a fueling signal. So when you do eat, you eat in the macros that, you know, the ketogenic diets is to eat, a little yeah. protein and, and, and more fat. And this is one of the reasons why the ketogenic diet works so well is because that fat um, satiates you. It fills you up. Yeah. Uh, there is a trick that I know Marty Kendall from Optimizing Nutrition came up with an idea of using your glucose meter to determine whether you're hungry or not. And, and basically huh. what he said was know what your average glucose requirement is and uh, so you basically test yourself on a regular basis, you know, uh, Every couple of hours, test your glucose, get a feel for what your glucose normally is during the day and come up mm. with an average number. And then if you ever feel like you're hungry, test your glucose. And if you are below your average glucose, then you may be hungry. And if you're above your average glucose, then maybe you're not so hungry. Maybe you've got some energy in your system. Maybe you don't really need to eat that uh eat that extra piece of bacon. That's also interesting because it seems like something you wouldn't have to do very many times before you actually can recognize what real hunger yeah. feels like. Yeah, that's really what you're trying to do is we're trying to close the feedback loop so this all becomes innate. This was when I first started keto, I, I recognized that I really didn't want to be 80 years old and cal calculating my daily macros and yeah. you know, all this kind of thing. I wanted to get to the point where I could innately – appropriately fuel myself and be healthy, not put on weight, right. uh, not lose weight, not gain weight, just be healthy um, and have my body instinctively be able to set me up for doing that. And to do this, you really need to, you need to teach yourself. You need to go through a couple of these little tricks to uh, be mindful about, I'm getting a hunger signal. Now, what am I going to do about it? Is it a real hunger signal? Or maybe it's, maybe I've just seen something, maybe I've just seen an ad on TV and it's, it's triggered me and now I'm thinking, oh, I might eat something, you know? Right. And so here's another thing that, you know, so low blood sugar can, in, can give you real hunger signals, but sure. high blood sugar can also give you, you know, those false hunger signals, right? right? Yeah. So if you feel like eating, you know, and maybe it feels a little bit like a carb craving. And you take your glucose and it's higher than average. Hmm. Maybe you ate something that had too many carbs. Uh, well, that's true. Maybe yeah. for whatever reason, your insulin has gone up to, you know, and your sugar is up. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. The, the problem is you raise your glucose, your body produces insulin, and insulin is uh, shuttles all the energy into your fat cells. That lowers the yeah. energy in your blood, and then you feel hungry again. Right. And this is, the, you know, in these carb craving times, this is how you can have a full stomach and yet be starving at the same time. Yeah. Because you don't have access to your fat stores because your insulin is too high. Sure. Your liver can't burn your fat for yeah. energy. Yeah. And you haven't given it enough carbohydrates. Right. And maybe you're running low on glycogen. Yeah. And so you are effectively starving. If you're insulin resistant, you your insulin probably doesn't work that well and you can't get glucose in and- that insulin's too yeah. high to release fat, so you literally metabolically, yep. you're at a cellular level, you're starving. So it's no, no right. surprise. I remember going to my doctor. I think it must have been like 2012, and saying to him, "I've got a problem. My hunger exceeds the physical capacity of my stomach. Yeah, my stomach is full. I can't fit anything else in, and I'm starving." Yeah. What is wrong? And he he basically he got he had me go for an ultrasound to see if there was maybe there was some tumor involved or you know something involved. There wasn't. It just turns out that I was insulin resistant and I was uh, becoming very very diabetic. I was metabolically deranged. Mm. And the simple trick was once I removed all carbohydrate out of my diet, 
all of a sudden my insulin levels came down and my ability to, to one, move fat out of my body fat and use it for energy yeah. went up and my ability to mm. see when hung, uh, ghrelin and leptin signals started working and I was able to determine when my belly was full and when my when I was hungry so yes it was uh, it was a remarkable thing yeah yeah i think the thing the bottom line for hunger with me is that i want to be able to trust it i want to be able to respect what it's telling me i want it to be able to basically rely on it as my fuel gauge and to know that when i'm hungry i need to add some energy into my system and when i'm not hungry mm. i don't need to to eat and i think that's mm. That instinctive uh, capability is is what I'm really after, and that's what the so far the ketogenic diet is giving me. That a lot of people who diet distrust their hunger. We've come to think of it as an unreliable witness, but really, I think that mm -hmm. uh, we have to get to the point where we engage with it mindfully and learn how to rely on it because it's the only way forward. There's no way that we're going to be 80 years old and calculating macros. Uh, that that being on a diet for the rest of your life doesn't make right. sense. So, so the short answer is lower your insulin, and you'll be able to hear that signal. Yeah, and uh, with the, maybe with the help of a glucometer, yeah, you can learn to recognize what is I need. You know, some energy, and uh, I just you know my body craves sugar. Yeah, learn to figure out the difference. So somebody in our forums asked about. What happens at maintenance? Do you eat more carbs or do you eat more fat? Mm. And uh, I think probably it's worth looking at uh, the Atkins program. Yeah. Dr. Atkins pretty much had everything exactly right, but he made two fundamental errors. The first was, was that he allowed people to eat too much protein. Right. And the second was that he believed that when you get to maintenance, you have to titrate up the amount of carbohydrates that you eat. So you then learn what your personal carb level is to be able to maintain your own body weight. Right, right. But the problem is when we eat carbs, we lose our hunger signaling and things spiral out of control. Sure. You know, the nutritional ketosis model that we follow works when you hit maintenance just as it worked when you were losing weight. You still keep eating only trace amounts of carbs and you still keep eating your maintenance level of protein yeah. and you eat fat to satiety. Right. And that last point is the key one. Mm. We're getting our energy from fat. As you get close to maintenance, you will have less body fat available and so you will naturally become more hungry. And if you eat fat to satiety, then as you get closer to maintenance, you end up eating more plate fat. Yeah, of course. So hunger is the missing element here that naturally should slow your weight loss as you have less body fat and as you get to closer to your appropriate maintenance weight. Yep, I completely agree. Well, we're getting towards the end of the show, Richard. Um, we've only got one more thing that we've got to do today. What's that? Recipes! Recipes! <laughs> Recipes. Recipes. Play that Recipes. funky music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go first today. Yeah, go for it. I love Caveman Keto. Okay. Dot com. Mm -hmm. This guy does the coolest stuff, and a lot of the stuff that he cooks, um, I've already done. But every once in a while, I come across a recipe, and I go, ooh. Mm. And this is one of them. Okay. Beer can burgers. Ooh. All right, now you heard of beer can chicken. I, well, you've done beer can chicken before. I had no idea that you actually drink some of the beer first. I didn't know drinking, yeah, right. drinking beer was part of, part of the process. So when you think of beer can burgers, you think, what? What? You know, what if I got to <laughs> stick a burger on a beer can? So actually, it's a little bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek. You only use a beer can to smush a cylindrical indentation into a ball of ground beef. Uh, and then you stuff it. Nice. Yeah, nice. So essentially what he's doing is creating a smoker packet and oh. he's getting, uh, you know, smoking indirectly right. these burger balls that you basically stick a can of beer into and, you know, it forms a mold. I'm looking at the site now. And then uh, you wrap it in bacon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that look good? And then you can fill with a variety of things that you normally put on the topping of a burger. So he's got onions, mushrooms, pepper jack cubes, uh, green peppers, and Brussels sprouts even. And then he covers the top with 
shredded cheddar cheese, just for good measure. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And then you grill it with the smoke, so you get a little smoky flavor as well. Yeah, nice. And uh, over indirect heat. That's a really good technique for smoking, for hot smoking. You know, if you don't have a hot smoker, um, then, uh, you know, getting it, getting onto a barbecue. The only problem is the heat gets a little bit of, it gets, can get away from you. Um, yeah. But, but still, it's, uh, you know, if you can make the heat indirect, like putting some plates on there um, and putting the food mm. up off, off the surface, then that's yep. a really good technique for, you know, with a lid over the top. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm. So what's good about this, the indirect heat method keeps the burger nice and medium rare while melting the cheese and cooking the bacon. Nice. Mm, yum, 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 yum. Yeah. Way to go, caveman keto. Yeah. Thank Keep you. Keep it going. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a recipe today. It's a simple one. I've, I, I want to do a bunch of vegetable recipes. So I did last week I did the butter poached uh, cauliflower, which is delicious. Yeah. So I'm going to do baked potty marins. Now, a pot of marin is it's a French uh, gourd, I guess you could. Might, I guess in America you might call it like a squash. It's about the yeah. It's about the size of a of a softball, and okay. it, they grow really easily. We 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 grow them in our garden. You can buy the seeds uh, online. Just uh, basically. Uh, Plant them at springtime and you won't see them until autumn. And then all of a sudden you'll you'll see these uh, these little orange squash and uh, you pluck them out, put them in a basket, and you they'll basically last the whole of the winter. But it's basically a winter crop. And so what I yeah. do is I I cut the tops and tails off of the of the round ball. So basically what I'm doing is I'm making a flat surface so it's going to sit flat. And then I cut it in half and I scoop out the seeds. It's got seeds like a pumpkin. It's very similar to a little pumpkin. Um, it's lower carb than most pumpkins, so but you don't eat, end up eating a lot. It's actually a very small amount of food. But basically what uh, what you do is you put these two halves of pot of marins on a tray in the oven and I just put like a teaspoon of butter in each one and sprinkle a bit of salt Ooh. over the top. And I just leave it there in a 180 Celsius oven for about half an hour. And yeah. you need to go in after, maybe after 20 minutes, you can get a knife and just slide it in just to see if it's nice and soft. Yep. Once it's soft, it, it might only take 25 minutes or so. Uh, but, uh, you know, if it's, if it, after 30 minutes, it's still, uh, resisting the knife, leaving for a couple more minutes until it softens up. So now you've got this, uh, pot of marin. It's basically like a little cup. A little yep. bowl, and mm. I just put I just put uh, pulled meat <laughs> straight in there and top it with some cheese. Put it straight back in the oven yeah. and get the cheese all melted over the top, and that makes a nice little meal. So I got to tell you that uh, I love your idea of making these big roast porks and lambs and things, and then pulling pieces off and individually freezing uh, oh. with a uh, with a food saver. Yeah. Works so well. I've done that. I'm I made two great big perneals for my party, and that's the Cuban roast pork butt okay. that I yeah, yeah. talked about. Yep. And I had almost an entire roast left over. Oh wow. Yep. And in a whole lot of uh the drippings. Yeah. Yeah. And uh basically Exactly what I did before. I took those drippings, I boiled them down, and those drippings had all the gelatin in it from the bones and everything. Oh, yeah. And I thickened it up with heavy cream and reduced yeah. it so it was this nice sauce. <laughs> and I just, I used my uh, food saver, yeah. you know, which in seconds f seals uh, a bag. Yeah. And I have, you know, just enough for one meal with the sauce right in it. And I just made, I made like 10 or 12 of those. And put them in the freezer. Lovely. How big are your portions? Maybe a half pound. Yeah, okay. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have so plenty. Two hundred grams we do, which is a little bit it's a bit close to half a pound, yeah. So it's enough yeah. for just Julie and I. Um yeah, yep. I pretty much have just the pulled meat in the bag. And then when I reconstitute it, I'll toss in some spices or something to to to, to make a sauce. So you're putting it in with the sauce, which uh, that sauce is going to be delicious because that's <laughs> that's cream plus the dripping, and it's going to be delicious. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's a show, my friend. Yep. Again, we're we're just a little bit short, but I don't think anybody minds. This was uh, nutritionally dense. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was nutritionally dense. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, oh, yeah. something that you didn't agree with, some more research you found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. Yeah, or join us in the Facebook forum. fb.twoketo.com. Send us a tweet at Two Keto Dudes. Follow us on Instagram, Two Keto Dudes. You know how to get in touch yeah. with us. Just go right ahead. Keep calm and keto on, my friends. Keep calm and keto on. We'll see you next time on Two, Two Keto, keto Dudes. Dudes.